Well, it's a cracker opening for the market. No two ways about that. Look at Bajaj FinServe. It's just flying away right now. 6.5% higher on that stock. And volumes are also picking up uh, quite a bit. Almost 7% rally on Bajaj FinServe. That's a large cap. And not once have we seen any kind of profit taking. It's been smooth sailing so far in the first half an hour of trade. Now, one space that has done quite well is the real estate market. Most real estate stocks at 52-week highs as we speak. The Mumbai property registrations have come in strong with over 20% year-over-year growth. August traditionally rec uh, records a sequential drop in registrations, but it has been the best August in the last 10 years. And I think it'll be better to show a one-year chart of uh, Mahindra Life Spaces to understand which way these stocks have moved. Today, of course, the stock is just, you know, taking a bit of a breather. Look at that. It's doubled in the last 12 months, uh, this stock. Arvind Subramanian, who's the MD and CEO at Mahindra Life Spaces, joins us now to talk about that. Arvind, always a pleasure speaking with you. The momentum is definitely picking up in this space, but how has September been so far in terms of, you know, collections, uh, growth, and what are the targets that you have uh, outlined for the full year? Pleasure is entirely mine, Sonia. Uh, as you mentioned, it's been a fantastic uh, second quarter. Seasonally, uh, particularly in the Mumbai market, the second quarter tends to be softer because of the monsoons and uh, other factors. Uh, but this year, we've seen a very strong growth uh, sequentially from uh, quarter to quarter, uh, right from Q4 onwards. And we are continuing to see strong end-user demand, which is driving residential sales. Okay. Although for the next 10, 15 days, because of uh, the Shraad period here in Mumbai, uh, things may be a little slow, right? That's right. So during the Shraad period, typically uh, new house purchases don't happen, but a lot of walk-ins and inquiries happen. So we do expect that to convert towards the end of the month once Shraad gets over. Mm. You have a long-term target, which is 2,500 crore bookings with 4 million square feet of volumes. Can you tell us, uh, can you break that up for us in terms of the near term? What are you looking at? Have your targets gone up because of, uh, you know, the way the market has spanned out? No, we are holding on to that target. As I've always said, that is our first pit stop or our first milestone in our growth journey. Uh, we do uh, see strong tailwinds and do believe that we are well on course to meet that target. If you look at the last couple of years, we did about just under 700 crores in FY21 and uh, just over 1,000 crores in FY22. So a strong uh, trajectory. We expect to maintain similar growth this year as well. And going into next year, the pipeline is looking very strong. The reason we're not uh, recalibrating the target is this business does tend to be a little bit choppy. So we don't want to get us ahead of ourselves. And a lot of our growth will depend on continued land acquisition. Sure. No, the reason I ask is if, you know, you look at the bookings, right, the trend, and that graph will be there on the screen for our viewers, there's been an outsized gain that you've seen in Q1. I mean, 600 crores. On an average, you would be doing about 150 to 300 crores, max 350 crores. So is it just an aberration, this Q1 number, or do you think that you can sustain it above five, 600 crores on an average for the rest of the year? I would like to think it's not an aberration, but uh, we must recognize there were uh, two very strong new launches in that quarter. Uh, we had Mahindra Eden, our first net zero energy project, which was launched in Bangalore. And we had uh, the last tower of our project in Gurgaon called Luminaire, uh, which was launched in that quarter. So both of them contributed very strongly. Uh, and we don't expect to have such similar cadence of launches in the subsequent quarters, or certainly not every quarter this year. So there will be a bit of an up and down, but uh, but I do believe what we've demonstrated is that we have the sales engine, the capacity uh, to deliver these kinds of numbers, uh, provided the raw material is there. Mm. Uh, Arvind, the last time you were on the program, you said that there is a huge amount of interest for redevelopment in societies in Mumbai. Uh, has anything uh, being firmed up in terms of, uh, you know, a, a contract, a deal, etc.? Well, fingers crossed, we are in advanced conversations on a couple of situations in the redevelopment society, redevelopment space in Mumbai. And uh, if all things go well, uh, we should see some uh, some positive movement in the next couple of months. Uh, these do tend to be long cycle uh, decision processes because all the members need to form a consensus and choose the developers they want to work with. But we are finding ever since we've thrown our hat into that ring, uh, there's very strong interest and our, our phones are ringing off the hook. Uh, with uh, requests from societies to participate in their tender processes. Okay. So, you know, there's so much happening in this space right now. Uh, I mean, reports are indicating that the Adanis are looking to buy DB Realty. So those assets clearly are on the block. 
would you be interested in acquiring any such assets? We are looking at distressed assets and particularly uh, some transactions that are going through a, res a resolution process. Uh, but we are approaching it pretty cautiously. Uh, it's a new space for us, so we do need to uh, keep our eyes open, understand the risks involved with that. But we are participating in a couple of resolution processes. So these resolution uh, uh, process distressed assets that you're looking at, uh, what would be the geography, what kind of assets are we looking at, and any timelines on which it could uh, see fruition? Uh, currently, these are uh, Mumbai-based assets, mm. uh, but we are uh, keeping our eyes open for Pune and Bangalore as well, which are the other two residential markets of interest to us. Uh, but the, the current pipeline of the couple of deals that we are pursuing are both in Mumbai. All right. Uh... Thank you very much, uh, Arvind. Uh, you know, pleasure speaking with you, as always, here on CNBC TV 18 on the program. Thanks for your time uh, here. Well, the market uh, is doing just fine. We're up 116 points, uh, so there is absolutely no uh, let-up in the momentum that we are seeing. Three is to one advances to declines with about 40 minutes of trade behind us uh, is what we have. You know, chemicals was a space which, uh, which was doing very well yesterday, and you know, some of these names are starting to show up. So Deepak Nitrite now is the largest volume-led gainer. It was not there in the morning. Uh, it's up 3.5%. Uh, you know, Tata Investment I highlighted. Deepak Fertilizers is another one which is up 5%. Uh, so, uh, again, on volumes. Uh, GMM Fodler is up about uh, 5% uh, and uh, so on and so forth. So there is uh, some amount of newer names basically making an appearance E-Clerks, Whirlpool, Relaxo, uh, Dreamforks, which is the recent listing. Dreamforks is up about another 5%. Stocks at about 430. Uh, so lots of action in the broader markets uh, as, uh, as we take stock of things right now. Now, the defense space, we had an analyst join us earlier to talk to us about what the opportunity, etc., could be. We've got a company now uh, joining us. Musgaon Dock uh, Shipbuilders is uh, the name I'm talking about. The stock's been in an absolute tear. It's up 35% in the last one month. Uh, it's up 75% uh, in the last six months. Uh, the, in the latest uh, news flow, the Indian Navy has launched the stealth frigate Taragiri, launched by, built by Musgaon Dock Shipbuilders. Uh, this happened uh, last Sunday. To discuss uh, this, we have Mr. Sanjeev Singhal, Director of Finance of the company, join us uh, to take some questions. Sir, thanks very much. Great to have you with us here, and congratulations from all of us. Uh, could you... Thank you. Good morning to all. Uh, Good morning, sir. Could you tell us a little bit about your experience building this? How long did this take from a sort of a water of order uh, to delivery of the product? I mean, what was the life cycle like? And, uh, you know, uh, how does revenue booking and stuff for something like this work? And what have you booked as part of this? Uh, okay, this is a pretty long question. I would uh, take it in steps. Uh, if I consider the current order book of Mazdan Auction Builders, primarily we are executing three large level orders. One is the P-75 Sport Wheel Submarine, order for which was awarded to us in the year 2005. And uh, four submarines have already been delivered. Uh, we are expecting to deliver the fifth submarine this year uh, by December. And the sixth submarine uh, at the end of 23 or maybe first quarter of 24. So this would give you a certain idea with respect to the timelines with respect to execution of projects. Second project is the 50 Bravo phone number of destroyers, which was awarded to MDL in 2011, uh, against which the first delivery of the ship was made in October 21 last year. Uh, as far as the second ship delivery is concerned, we are awaiting the delivery. This could happen anytime uh, this month or early next month. And uh, 23, again, one delivery and 24, the last delivery. The third and the last order, which was awarded on MDL out of the current order book, this was in 2015. This is the stealth frigate, four in numbers, P-17 Alpha project. So the last delivery of this project is expected uh, somewhere in the middle of uh, 26. And considering that the warranty period and uh, defect liability period as well as the BND spares, we expect the order closure by uh, somewhere in 27, 28. Hmm. So you're saying that currently you have three large orders. There are two more submarines by FY24 and a fifth submarine by December of this year. So I didn't understand, in FY23 and FY24, what is the kind of revenues that you're expecting to flow through from these orders? Uh, as far as FY23 is concerned, uh, 21-22, we have registered a revenue of 5733 crores. 
uh, from operations and uh, we expect a 15 to 20 percent increase so that would be roughly around 6500 to something around 7000 in between figure uh, for fy 23 and uh, going ahead for 24 we again expect a, a revenue increase by approximately 20 percent okay. between these uh, destroyer submarines and frigates uh, what is the total unexecuted uh, part of the order book, the value uh, value of this uh, unexecuted order book? Approximately 43,000 crores. And, and all, okay, fair enough. And all of this uh, to be uh, delivered and uh, by, I mean... Uh, by, by last uh, vessel, we are expecting to be delivered in 26-27. Uh, 26-27. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> okay, and... Uh, should we expect any acceleration in uh, revenue booking in 24 or 25 or I mean how how does this usually work or this is going to be staggered like what we've been seeing 15 20 percent steady kind of growth uh, we are looking at a steady growth of 15 to 20 percent in between certain hiccups may be there in a year or two uh, but uh, not too much of an evolution so 15 to 20 percent steady growth mm -hmm. you've also been looking for export orders any update on that any progress there yeah, MDR has been exploring the export market, although I would not say that in a very big manner or a very encouraging response. Uh, we have been looking at various routes, including identification of the target countries. The GDG route, uh, as well as B2B route, uh, the, taking the help of the Indian High Commissions and the embassies uh, abroad and the uh, foreign commissioners available uh, in India. Mm. Uh, as far as uh, one uh, order with respect to part uh, in situ repairs of a Russian ship, uh, their MBL is required to uh, chip in by supply of manpower and expertise. Mm. This is at an advanced stage uh, of discussion. However, because of the uh, Ukraine Russia conflict, certain delays are there. So we continue to explore the export market, but I would not say that this is likely to be a very big chunk in the near future. Okay, so exports won't be a big chunk in the near future. Got that. You're sitting on good cash balance. You have over 11,000 crores of cash on the books. Any plans to return it back to shareholders, either in the form of a dividend payout or any large capex plans that you have? Uh, I would like to clarify, as far as this uh, total cash is concerned, this is a, the major component is the naval or the project cash. And as far as MBL cash component is concerned, this is roughly around 1,400 crores. Uh, with respect to this also, yes, we will be coming out with the dividend as per the government policies in this regard. We have been uh, consistently paying dividend uh, aligned to the government policies, so that will continue. With respect to the capex also, we have plans to spend around 200 250 crores this year, which will be primarily maintenance and administrative kind of a capex. In addition, certain large projects are being explored, including uh, the manufacture, in-house manufacturing of uh, a floating dry dock. And acquisition of certain infrastructure assets uh, from MBPT, but uh, they are at a fairly nascent stage of discussion. So I don't expect the expenditure to take in this year, but certain, certainly next year we expect a significant capex. Mm. Uh, has there been, uh, so just asking you this, I mean, has there been any uh, no, uh, notification from the Ministry of Defense with regards to emerg emergency purchase of, uh, you know, equipment uh, by the armed forces and uh, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, up to a certain level. I mean, I was reading up to 300 crores, uh, and you know, uh, the, the forces are expected to buy locally. Uh, has there been any uh, notification to this effect? And there is no direct notification as far as NDL is concerned. I am also aware of these uh, from the media reports uh, that certain emergency powers are being given to the armed forces, and uh, so I, probably there is a rider with respect to. Uh, Procurement from indigenous, indigenous sources. Okay. All right. Uh, so we leave it at that. Thanks a lot for joining in. We need to get back to the markets now because this market is really on a tear. 18,057 is where we're at. 121 points in the green. And the Sensex is up over 400 points. So Anuj, clearly, uh, I mean, you know, it's a secular move on the upside across the board. But we're seeing some outsized participation come in from the bank nifty this morning. Yes, uh, in fact, today has been uh, as secular as it can get, uh, Sonia. I'm just looking at the top four indices, uh, uh, the Sensex, Nifty, Midcap and Bank Nifty, are, all are up 0.6%. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, there are others participating as well. Titan, for example, is making a big move. Uh, Bajaj Finance and Finserve, Tata Consumer, HDFC Bank. Uh, so a lot of uh, stocks, even IT is doing well. 
just the kind of market that the bulls want, right? Uh, advanced decline also quite stable at around 2.5 is to 1. Uh, Mitesh is back with us. Uh, uh, Mitesh, been a solid sort of uh, morning. Uh, the market holding on to majority of the gains. Uh, your thoughts? Uh, and the bank nifty showing some signs of, uh, you know, uh, getting back that leadership. Uh, uh, what are your uh, sort of uh, views on the nifty and your stock calls? Well, uh, good continuation is seen on the upside. That's always a positive. And as I said, I think, you know, 18,165, 150 zone is the next target area. The good thing is that we had a gap up. And then, you know, while there was a mild selling after the gap up, that was immediately bought into. So I think 18,079, now becomes the important trailing support area. So just keep a stock below that, maybe 10 points below that. 7970 should be a trading stock. Not 18,165, 150 should be the target area. So maintain long with that. On the stock side, uh, Bajaj Finance, I think, is a stock which is breaking out very nicely. That's a buy of the stock at 73.50 for targets of 7,600. And Bata India is the other one. That's also giving a good signal on the intraday charts. It's more of slightly in the last few minutes, but let's around 1960, 1955 zone. Buy with the stock below 1940 for targets. Bank stocks have become market favorites. Among the larger indexes, it is the Nifty Bank, which looks set to reach all-time highs even before the Nifty. Uh, the Nifty PSU Bank Index, surprise, surprise, has done the best. Uh, it's gained 6% uh, month to date in September. Best performing index. Uh, banks like State Bank, Bank of Baroda, Indian Bank, as well Karur and DCB have all set, already set fresh 52-week highs in September. And the man who probably started this recent run is my guest today, Ashish Gupta, of uh, Credit Suisse, the managing director and the head of research there. Uh, Ashish, uh, you were the first to write a report raising the earnings of many banks, including SBI, by 5 to 15 percent this year. I think September 2nd was that report. And since then, this rally has got uh, some more legs. Of course, it started in uh, mid-June itself. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. Now, my first question is, is, it, is there a possibility of an even uh, another level of upgrades simply because look at the bond markets in spite of having a higher than expected inflation today we have lower the you know the yields have fallen this bond index thing is looking very imminent now so even further earnings upgrades can't be ruled out sure. so good morning lata uh, so uh, thanks for having me here today I think uh, uh, we definitely see that the risk on our earnings estimates are still on the upside. Oh. Uh, al although I would not peg it to inclusion in the bond index or uh, uh, really gains coming from uh, 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 bond losses being reversed, mm. but more so from operational earnings. I think uh, really in the last 15 years, we haven't seen the outlook for the bank so positive virtually on every front. Uh, whether it is margins, whether whether it is growth, and of course on asset quality, and I think uh, the bigger uh, drivers of surprise, uh, to my mind, over the next six months will be bank margins, uh, as well as credit costs. Okay. Oh yes, uh, credit costs. So you you're expecting that uh, uh, it can be even better than you put out. So so then let me ask the braver question: uh, Does it look like it can get as good as 2003 to 2008? Uh, you know, banks started slowly and then we, you know, as it is, look at the galloping credit uh, uh, growth. Uh, just the other day, we were in single digits and now 15 and a half rushing towards 16 percent non-food credit. Uh, we had gone even to 25 in the previous round. You think that we are somewhere like the 2003 uh, growth pace? Sure. So I think uh, uh, absolutely we, in terms of credit costs, we could be in an environment like 2003 to 2007. And this typically uh, uh, happens in every credit cycle, right? You have a period of aggressive uh, uh, provisioning for the banks, uh, and then you get to a period where, where there is below normalized provisioning. Right. Uh, so every credit cycle, you have uh, NPS coming and uh, provisions, uh, as you recall, in the last uh, couple of years, but as high as 3 to 4% of loans for the banks. 
and uh, uh, during a credit cycle actually banks pull back on lending they tighten their credit standards yeah. and and then you get a period where you get a below normalized uh, credit cost mm. so uh, i actually believe that over the next two years you will get below normalized credit cost for the banking system mm. Mm. Uh, and this will be across the space. It uh, would just be in private bank, but even state-owned banks, you will see the benefit of low credit costs. Low credit costs. You know, like the 2003 or 20% credit offtake also it can't be ruled out. So on growth, I think we need to be a bit more cautious. Uh, I think uh, we have to take into account the fact that uh, 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 actually part of the loan growth acceleration that we have seen is... Uh, actually driven by the fact that real rates were negative. Yeah. Uh, we believe by the end of the year, real rates uh, will get into the positive territory uh, as RBI is uh, going to be hiking rates uh, some more, as well as the fact that inflation will come down. Uh, but uh, uh, I will also like to point out that uh, the single digit credit growth that we had seen in the last couple of years, that was actually an outlier. Okay. So we have really had this period where credit growth uh, uh, falls below nominal GDP growth. Mm. And that was uh, really a, 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 the misnomer over the last couple of years because there was significant corporate deleveraging that was going on. Okay. All right, fair. Then we're just correcting an aberration. Uh, you know, your, uh, I'm looking at your ROE forecast for banks. Uh, if you yes. look, of course, the highest ROEs are coming still in some of the large private banks, but the delta yes. of ROE is very high in mid-cap banks. See, Bandhan is going from 1% yes. last year to 22%. RBL is going from minus 1% to 7%. So even if 7% and 6% for IDFC is not high, the delta is high. So do you think that Absolutely. we could see the next leg of rally, uh, you know, catch up in uh, mid-cap banks and even PSUs? Uh, definitely. I think uh, we saw in many of the larger banks the big credit cost moderation coming last year itself. Uh, so 2021 was the year when they had uh, uh, high credit costs uh, partly due to COVID and buffer provisions. And last year we saw credit cost moderate for them already below 200 basis points. Uh, this year, uh, while they still will see a moderation, but uh, uh, the smaller banks uh, uh, who did not see a moderation last year, uh, as they were still building up the vision and they had exposure to some segments that have delinquencies like microfinance, mm. they get the benefit this year. Okay. And uh, uh, therefore, the credit cost drop you will see in the mid-sized banks will be larger. And uh, that's what drives the ROE recovery that uh, you highlighted. Okay. Uh, you know, in your buy list, uh, you you have, of course, uh, uh, ICICI, IIB, uh, Innocent. ICICI and SBI are our preferred picks. That's the statement you make. But BOB has started coming into the chatter. Many people have uh, started including it. So is it uh, uh, something that you look at positively? And will more PSU banks catch the fancy of the market? Sure. So, uh, firstly, that I would not like to discuss specific names, okay. uh, but I can uh, certainly say that uh, uh, across the spectrum, uh, we are seeing uh, banks uh, uh, being cyclical beneficiaries. So, it's not going to be restricted to just the private banks or just the larger banks. It will benefit uh, the public sector banks, even the smaller banks. Uh, uh, the other thing uh, I would say when we look at public sector banks, uh, particularly the mid-sized banks, uh, one has to be careful about the long-term story and uh, uh, on the aspect on technology. Mm. So some of the public sector banks have uh, uh, done well, in fact, matched up to many of the private uh, sector peers in uh, being uh, able to upgrade their technology. Uh, but I don't uh, uh, think that is pervasive throughout the mid-sized banks. Okay. And as you know, that is going to be a big driver of uh, mm. business growth over the next two years, mm. uh, uh, particularly. So I think uh, we have to be uh, careful uh, in the names we choose that not just asset quality, but on technology front that uh, they're able to match. Okay, actually, I'm going to come back to the technology question in just a minute, but perhaps a more interesting question uh, for the market. You, I, I know you said you will not talk about specific banks, but I'm surprised HDFC Bank is not on your list. Uh, you have a list of buys. Uh, I mean, without giving a, 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 within your compliance limits, uh, why is it not in your list and uh, what's your view? So, 
Actually, uh, uh, I uh, again won't uh, speak of specific uh, names, uh, but uh, I think uh, there are uh, other uh, considerations as well uh, in terms of uh, our compliance. We are restricted on some okay. names, etc. Oh, so, sorry. Right. <laughs> That's a pity because I'm sure uh, there are a lot of viewers wanting to know. But let me come back to the technology question. You know, the recent digital paper that uh, rules that uh, Reserve Bank released and simultaneously the yeah. government announced that it intends to keep uh, UPI free. Uh, so yes. you think that this is going to eat into the margins of banks. They have to provide a service and they cannot charge for it. So, uh, so I think uh, they uh, clearly have to be at a higher cost of it. But I think we are also starting to see the benefits of it uh, accrue to the banks, right? And uh, benefits are not in uh, terms of just uh, uh, costs, uh, mm. because uh, uh, from handling cash, you, you go to digital transaction but benefits in terms of revenues, right? So across banks, if you, for example, see uh, unsecured lending growth, I think uh, uh, that benefit is uh, a reflection of the fact that banks are getting more comfortable with their customers uh, as they are getting more uh, data about their customers. And that is what uh, uh, instruments like UPI are, are enabling, okay. right? So I think uh, uh, while there are costs, there are revenues as well. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. But uh, or every banker you meet complains about the extent of technology costs that, uh, you know, is inexorably hitting them. Okay, you know, I began by telling you that in your ROE, uh, uh, you know, delta, the mid-cap banks look, uh, and some of the PSU banks look better than the large established and market favorite private sector banks. But when... I look at your data, the, you know, the bu contingency buffers, the high margins, the low credit, uh, the low cost of money. It looks like your sympathies are more with larger banks. Uh, what would you say? Are mid-cap banks a tactical buy, but larger banks your all-time favorites? Uh, how would you distinguish the two? Yes. So I think uh, 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 there is certainly uh, uh, a lot of uh, alpha there in the mid-cap banks as well. I think, uh, but we also have to be cognizant of the fact that uh, uh, globally we are uh, potentially going to be in an environment of rising rates, right? And that's the risk we need to factor in that uh, uh, liquidity, which is still in surplus in India. So while RBI has reduced the uh, magnitude of liquidity surplus, mm -hmm. we still don't have deficit liquidity. Right. And uh, uh, this has been reflected in the fact that uh, while banks have raised deposit rates, the magnitude of deposit rate hikes have been lower than uh, on the, on the increase in lending rates. But if, say, six, nine months from now, uh, the liquidity moves into a deficit and you see sharper uh, uh, deposit cost increases, I think uh, uh, that's a scenario that will favor the larger banks uh, uh, more than the mid-sized banks who will see a bigger pressure on their funding costs. So I think uh, 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 in terms of the risk profile, uh, the larger banks, I believe, have uh, 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 more sustainable recovery uh, um, um, and the potential risk from, um, 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 although it's not our base case, but a very tight liquidity environment six months from now. Oh, okay, then let me turn the question on its head. I began by asking you that, uh, does it feel like the 2003 to 2008 period? And you said that, you know, you're, if anything, you are prepared for upside surprises in your earnings forecasts. Uh, you think the run is not so long then that, uh, uh, you know, it, it, the party is perhaps a couple of years in terms of visibility? So I think uh, we have to uh, look at uh, the stock performance in terms of two aspects. One is earnings and se second is multiples. Right. So I think earnings is where one can be quite confident on, um, uh, uh, both on uh, growth in terms of margin and credit costs. I think multiple is something that uh, we need to be cognizant about. And uh, uh, for most matters, uh, the cost of capital for investors is the global cost of capital. Right. And uh, I think that is the risk we need to watch out for, that if global cost of capital increases sharply and we uh, uh, get back to oh, you know, scenarios where U.S. long bond yields uh, uh, go up uh, well over 3%, uh, 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 
I think uh, that's when the multiple this starts to oh, 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 come for the banking sector. Uh, and uh, uh, that is something that can stimulate the rally. Okay. Yeah, then we have to wait for the global environment. Okay, uh, I'm warned that I'm running out of time. But let me ask you just one question on NBFCs then. How do they fit yeah. into this picture? Are they going to be better than banks? Or would your f hot favorites be large banks, uh, which you've already mentioned in your report, and NBFCs follow? Yeah, so I would uh, prefer banks over NBFCs. I think uh, um, uh, even in terms of growth, you will see that uh, banks outpace NBFCs. Uh, yes, NBFCs, uh, like the mid-sized banks, will benefit from the credit cost moderation. But I think uh, um, you know, most of the banks, uh, including the larger ones, will probably grow faster than most NBFCs still. Okay, and within NBFCs, is there any preference uh, for the larger ones? Will it be uh, CV uh, makers because, you know, the CV cycle seems to be doing better? Or will it be uh, the personal finance guys? What would the, since you don't talk stocks, how would you have us lean? So actually, we have, uh, uh, we like uh, uh, some NBFCs uh, who are vehicle financiers. We also like some personal finance NBFC. So it's not so much uh, segment driven within the NBFCs, but more company specific. Okay, okay. And uh, just the last one, uh, we see a lot of uh, uh, churn happening in uh, the fintech space as well. Uh, will any of them move into your Ken as a buy or uh, are you still more comfortable uh, not having them in your list? Yeah, so, so as of now, um, only a couple of them are listed. So I think uh, you know, we would like to see more fintechs get listed and more kind of business models come up. Uh, I definitely feel that many of them have uh, very compelling business propositions. Uh, of course, that has to be measured up against the multiples they are commanding. Okay, uh, just a final question. There are people going with QIB's banks. Uh, is there enough foreign appetite for, uh, uh, the, you know, the mid-cap banks? Well, I think so. I think uh, as people are getting comfortable with the uh, um, uh, asset quality stability across uh, the sector, as they are getting uh, more confident that uh, growth is uh, getting more broad-based, so it's not just... Uh, corporate recovery driven, but uh, consumer segments are growing. And uh, as you mentioned, commercial vehicle segments mm. are growing. People are willing to look at uh, lenders who predominate these segments. Okay. We'll have to leave it at that. Thank you very much, Ashish Gupta, uh, for joining us. So what stays with me is uh, this, uh, I mean, uh, best of breed uh, experts on finance matters saying that if anything, there is an upside risk to earnings upgrades of banks. Uh, so that's excellent, especially for the larger banks uh, where he thinks the benefits are greater, more in terms of margins and in terms of the buffers they have. Uh, well, uh, that's it on It's the Economy. We're going to a break. There's lots more lined up for you.